Hey, it's Mover Scott from the Imagination Movers, and you're watching a podcast where nostalgia comes alive. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Roll it! Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. Happy you're here with us. I'm your host, Jake Duffenbaugh. With me today is Ari Sarkos, Chris Bixby, and Matt Bingo. How are you guys doing? We're good, Hello. Jake. Hello, how are you doing, folks? We're, yes, and how are you doing, Jake? I'm doing great, as always. Thank you for asking. And, and who do we have for today? Yes, so today's guest we have for today, he's a musician, songwriter, who is a founder and former lead singer of the acapella musical group Wacapella and a pioneer of the modern acapella movement. And he's also a part of other projects we're going to talk about, such as We're in the World's Commerce San Diego, Out of the Box, The Book of Pooh, and a bunch of other stuff we'll talk about later on. Here he is, Mr. Sean Altman. How are you here, Sean? How Thanks for here? having me. <laughs> yes, sure. Happy to have you here. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yes, thank you. So, so to kick things off, we know who you are, but for those who don't, even though I mostly did your introduction, would you care to I- introduce yourself a little bit and what you do? Yes. Uh, my name is Sean Altman. I live in New York City. My uh, my first introduction to this world was as a as the founding member of a vocal group Rockapella, which was and still is a, a contemporary uh, vocal group. It's uh, five members. I was in the group for the first 11 years. The group has been going on for 20 something years after I left, it's still going on, but I'm not part of it anymore. But while we were, uh, while I was in the group, we appeared for five years as the house band and actors on the Emmy and Peabody award-winning PBS television series, Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? And uh, my, Biggest claim to fame is that I co-wrote the that theme song with uh, my high school and college friend, David Yazbek. And that song is now considered one of the 50 greatest theme songs in television history by, I forgot who named it that recently. I think Rolling Stone. Oh, yeah, wow. Maybe, no, no, no. It's like, wow. it's, it's one of the 100 best theme songs. I don't wow. want to say fifty. I think it's because I think it's like number. <laughs> I think it's like number fifty-two. <laughs> uh, okay, and then after I. Uh, oh, that's awesome, I left, though. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, then after I left uh, Rockapella, um, I've been uh, releasing solo albums of my original material since then, and I've had a couple of other um, vocal group projects. Uh, I'm in a I'm in a, an acapella group called the Groove Barbers. Um. I've produced a bunch of other people's records, and currently, uh, uh, I'm in two tribute acts: the Everly Set, which is an Everly Brothers tribute act, and Forever Simon and Garfunkel, which is a Simon and Garfunkel tribute act. But all along, since the um, since the mid '90s, I've uh, I've always done a lot of writing for television, and I've written songs for uh, Out of the Box, The Book of Pooh. Uh, Gullah Gullah Island, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, and I wrote, I co-wrote all the music for Where in Time is Carmen San Diego, which is the PBS series that came after Where in the World, and that's what I do. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic, fantastic. So, what was your background like, and how did you grow up? I grew up in the Bronx in New York City. Um, I started singing professionally when I was uh, 17 years old with um, my friend David Yazbek, who ended up being the guy that I, I co-wrote um, the Carmen San Diego theme song with. He's now uh, one of the most successful Broadway writers of the last you know 20 years, having won uh, a Tony Award for The Band's Visit, and he's also written a bunch of other musicals. But he and I, we, we were a high school folk and pop and jazz vocal duo. And uh, we so we were playing clubs around New York City when I was 17 years old. 
then uh, we continued collaborating when we were uh, both at Brown University. And then also at Brown University, that's where I, I met uh, the guys um, with whom I would form Rockapella shortly after college in uh, the late 80s. But I, I've always been mostly a singer. I didn't really start writing uh, songs until I was in my 30s. And, uh, and my first uh, foray into writing for kids television was with where in the world is Carmen San Diego, and I, you know, kind of got lucky by by hitting a home run right right off the bat. And then after the success of that theme song, then other shows have contacted me, and I've always uh, kept my kept a toe in kids music writing. But I, you know, I write for a lot of different people. I write I write songs that are for television, and I also write comedy songs that are as far away from kids television as possible really really dirty songs <laughs> so now with music who are some of your like biggest musical influences the beatles is the biggest uh oh, of course oh, yeah, I've, 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 I've always just liked vocal harmony and really catchy melodies and short songs and I'm not a, I wouldn't call myself a guitar player, but I play guitar on stage. So I, I have an attraction to kind of jangly 60s, 70s pop. But also, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of um, of 60s and 70s R&B. I was really good friends with uh, the lead singer of a vocal group called The Persuasions, who were considered oh, yeah. the, the godfathers of of uh, acapella. They're a uh, 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 African American Brooklyn vocal group, uh, you know, since the early early sixties, and the lead singer who sadly passed away a few years ago, he and I were very close, and he was sort of a mentor to me. So I've always gravitated toward uh, sort of soulful gospel inflected uh, R and B vocals. So I um, I'm kind of you know, so I guess the Beatles and the Persuasions are my two biggest vocal influences. Nice. Awesome. So one of the things you're most known for in music is being a founding member of the acapella group, Wacapella. Can you talk a bit about how that was formed? Yeah. Um, so uh, when I arrived at um, in college in 1979, I was immediately inducted into the the only male a cappella group on campus, which was a, a group called the Hijinks. And uh, four guys from the Hijinks formed Rockapella after we graduated. So I, I sang with the Hijinks in college and, and we were singing barbershop music and doo-wop and pop and a lot of persuasions arrangements. And then when we uh, when we graduated, we started singing on the street in Manhattan. And um, we started doing private parties and local television programs. And uh, we started um, working out our repertoire at comedy clubs. And at one of those comedy clubs, uh, uh, a guy who was the, uh, he's considered, you know, sort of a legend in, in comedy club lore, a guy named Lucian Hold, he booked a club called the Comic Strip, and he saw us on the street and thought we were funny. And he said, "Hey, why don't you why don't you start working on your act at the club?" So that's when we started injecting a lot of comedy and uh, synchronized movements, and they call it shtick into the act. And working out also at that club at the time were fledgling comics like Adam Sandler, Chris Rock. Uh, yeah. John Stewart. So um, we were we were appearing with those guys at the time. You know they were they were relatively unknown, and then um, we were uh, we were picked up uh, on a PBS TV special about acapella called Spike Lee and Company Do It Acapella in 1991, and it was a a documentary hosted by Spike Lee about the state of acapella music at that time. And so it was uh, six six groups, uh, including Take Six, who was a you know Grammy winning um, jazz vocal group, and um, the 
situations who were our idols. Uh, Lady Smith Black Mombazo from South Africa, who were famous at that point for having been on Paul Simon's um, Graceland album. And uh, it was a bunch of groups and us. And we distinguished ourselves by, first of all, being the only white group. And second of all, being kind of like zany comic. Uh, uh, you know, there was a lot of quirky movements and, and uh, kind of jokey lyrics and jokey movements and um the producers of a of a tv show in production called where in the world is carmen san diego saw us on that pbs special spike lee and company do it acapella and asked us if we wanted to audition for the role of being the house vocal group on that show and uh we had never heard of the franchise where in the world is carmen san diego it, it was a uh it was a popular computer game, but I had never heard of it. And uh, we got the gig. And next thing we knew, we were on national television every day for five years. And we uh, we were featured on all 295 episodes of that TV show. And that really made our career in America. Simultaneously, we had a Japanese record deal. And that Japanese company wanted us to write original music. So we were started writing songs. And that's how I sort of became a songwriter in the nice. mid 90s. And yeah. uh, I stayed, I was with Rockapella until uh, 1997 after after Carmen San Diego had gone off the air. Nice. Nice. So now in the beginning, you kind of mentioned this a bit already, but um, now in the beginning, Rockapella kind of started out performing on, you know, on the street. And then you mentioned, you know, now performing at clubs. What was that kind of transition like from, you know, kind of street performing to now getting to perform at a club? Yeah, uh, performing at a club forced us to tighten up the act. And also, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, we were we were really working on the act at a comedy club. So there was a, uh, a premium placed on being funny. And... Um, so we had all kinds of props and just, you know, we were doing a lot of novelty songs because we were trying as much to get people to smile with the harmonies, but also to get them to laugh. And that was sort of, that was really instrumental in the development of the act. Cause I think had we not done that, we probably would not have been cast on Carmen San Diego. Cause we were, we were definitely perceived as being funny. And also we had kind of really strange synchronized movements we um we were doing it wasn't really dancing it was more like quick quirky almost uh kind of herky jerky synchronized movements um we were working with a a movement a movement coach named Joan Merwin who had been a, in a uh, in a movement troupe called the Adapters and they weren't they were they were a dance troupe but they were more about creating weird shapes on stage so as opposed to groups like, oh, sorry. That's okay. Folk, folk know, no, 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 it's not. It's okay. That out. <laughs> um, so as opposed to groups uh, like old vocal groups like the Drifters and the, the Coasters who did really sort of more dance-oriented synchronized movements, ours were more about creating weird shapes and doing weird things with our hands and with our heads. Uh, and it worked really well for us because we never – got winded as opposed to, you know, when you see people dance on Broadway, you know, they're doing all these really elaborate steps, but as singers, we, we couldn't really do that. So it was more about creating weird, funny shapes and positions with our bodies. Um, and um, we, we really honed that at, uh, in the clubs, it was comedy clubs and then it was sort of cabaret clubs. And also, you know, we honed our patter, you know, uh, Putting together an an act is a lot more about just rehearsing the music. It's about right. what happens, but what happens between the songs, having it seem effortless, effortlessly um, improvisational, while really kind of adhering to a script. You know, who which guy does which intro, uh, just keeping it everything tight and engaging. So that's what working at the clubs really helped us do. Nice. Very nice. Now, now I'm curious. What were some of your favorite locations 
to perform at with Rockapella, other than the TV studio. Of sure. Course. Uh, well, we 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 have a special fondness for uh, a club which has now been extinct for wow, maybe a dozen or more years, called the Bottom Line, uh, because the Bottom Line was one of the the biggest, most prestigious music clubs in New York City for probably 30 years. And we always wanted to play there. And when we finally got to play there, we we uh, did a bunch of double bills with our idols, the Persuasions. So, uh, and we sold out a whole bunch of shows there with the Persuasions and then without the Persuasions. So before the group started performing in theaters around the country, uh, that was really our, our home in New York City. And so we always have special feeling for the bottom line and we miss it very much you know the and the bottom line is legendary when everyone's played there from bruce springsteen to uh you know ringo star and oh nice you know, yeah it's it's fame classic uh new york listening club nice so now what are some of your favorite uh songs that rockapella covered because i know you have well, definitely like you mentioned you covered a lot of uh pop and rock songs yeah um so the song that really started it out for us was a, a calypso novelty song from the 1950s called the zombie jamboree and uh you know the, it, the zombie jamboree was written by a, a calypso artist named uh conrad Mogge jr and, it, and the original version is by some a group called something like lord invader and his 12 penetrators or some weird novelty song like uh name like that i've never even heard the original version but there have been so many other famous versions by harry belafonte the kingston trio um trying to think of other versions the first the uh, the first version i heard was when i was maybe four or five years old and my mom had a a calypso record from a local club band in Washington DC area. So I grew up hearing the song. And uh, when then when I was when I was in uh, the hijinks in college, I thought, wow, you know, I, you know, I've never heard anybody perform this song and I love it. And so I, uh, I did a vocal arrangement of it. And it, it ended up being Rockapella's signature song for many years. And we even did it on uh, the Tonight Show. At the time, it was the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. But uh, oh, when we, when, when wow. we, yeah, but when we did it, uh, Jay Leno was the guest host, so he hadn't even taken over as the full time host. Mm. But uh, yeah, we did it. I think it was New Year's Eve, nineteen ninety one, um, right after we had gotten our Karma San Diego, and so that that was you know I always think of that song as the song that kind of made my career, so I always have a special feeling for that one. But other. So, favorite songs of mine to sing were uh, the Roy Orbison song, Pretty Woman. Um, I've one. always, uh, yeah, um, my first solo when I was in my college acapella group was the Van Morrison song, Moon Dance. So those are a few of, of the songs that have always, uh, you know, I still get a warm feeling when I think about those songs. But, you know, the, the, in the end, <laughs> the songs that are most meaningful to me are the ones that I wrote myself because, you know, they're, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say autobiographical, but they're, they were, uh, they were the first songs I wrote for acapella were really among the first songs that I wrote period. Mm -hmm. So they, they were sort of like my first baby, my first babies. Since then I've written hundreds of songs, but those, <laughs> those first few on, on acapella records were really special to me because uh, I remember thinking like, wow, I wrote a song and it's actually on a CD at the time. CDs were a very new, a new right. medium. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So oh, another, uh, another favorite song of mine, uh, which won an award for best arrangement from the contemporary acapella society was uh, the Holly song, long, cool woman in, in a black dress. Oh, nice. Famous, famous classic rock song. Oh, yeah. I always love that one. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. So similarly, on that topic, do you have any favorite original rock songs? 
Yeah. Um, my favorite, my, I guess my favorite has to be the Carmen San Diego song because it's the one that <laughs> it's the, it's, it's pretty much the only original song of mine that's ever really made me some, some real money. I hate to sound mercenary about it, but you know, listen, people, people say that, you know, people write songs for, for love, but it's also really nice to make a living at it. And so that yeah. song is really the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, here it is. Uh, yeah. Wow. 30 year, 33 years after I wrote it and it's still, um, people still license it. It was just used in the Carmen San Diego Netflix, uh, cartoon series they're working on a movie and i hope that they'll use it in the movie and so uh you know that song that, that's always going to be my favorite uh but other favorites of mine are um uh, a song called follow me to heaven a song called my home which i wrote with um david yazbek who also wrote the carmen san diego theme song with me uh a song called falling over you which i wrote with my friend uh, Billy Strauss, who wrote uh, a lot of the songs for um, uh, Dora the Explorer and uh, and Out of the Box and Gullah Gullah Island. And uh, he was also one of Rockapella's uh, first record producers. Nice. Um, and, uh, and a song called Come My Way, which is always, because uh, the, the first ones that I ever wrote, which I thought were, were really good songs, the, those are the ones that I, I still I'm grateful for them. Awesome. I had to I had to write a lot of shitty songs before I wrote a few good ones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so now you mentioned earlier, uh, Rockapella released a bunch of albums in both the USA and Japan. Can you kind of talk about a bit about the albums and how they kind of came about? Yeah. Um, so when. Uh, when we got cast on Where in the World is Carmen San Diego in uh, 1991, um, high tenor Scott Leonard, who's still in Rockapella, by the way, um, you know, almost 30 years later, <laughs> wow. he uh, he had sung in uh, he had sung at Tokyo Disneyland, and so he had and he had released a solo album in Japan, even though he's uh, he's an, you know he's American. And he's from, you know, Indiana. But he, when he joined the group to be on Carmen San Diego, he had all these Japanese contacts. And he pitched us to a, a Japanese record producer that he knew. And uh, they and a Japanese record company signed us. And that was really critical for us because in America, we were on Carmen San Diego and we were singing only covers and parody songs of covers on Carmen San Diego. But because of this Japanese record deal, we were singing for adults in Japan and that record company wanted us to write our own songs. So we all started writing songs and um, we put out eight albums in Japan over a four year period, a four or five year period. And we toured eight times there doing some covers, but mostly originals. So that that record deal uh, was you know, hugely influential in my life and in my career, because had it not been for that, I think I would, I would have, I probably wouldn't have started writing songs. It was only because the record company said, we want you to write songs that I started writing songs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then Rockapella also released some albums in the U S and, um, and then when I quit Rockapella, I, I continued to write songs. And so you know, had it not been for that, Japanese record deal and those eight albums. Uh, I, I think I probably would have just stayed mostly a singer and I would have written the Carmen San Diego theme song and a few other things. But uh, because of that, the impetus of writing originals, uh, you know, really changed my life. Uh, mm -hmm. Awesome. Definitely. So, how would you say Wakapella's sound has evolved over the years? Well, it, it's, you remember Rockapella started in 1986. And so that, yeah. that's, that's coming in three years. That'll be 40 years. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so the sound is, 
it, you know, because it's a vocal group, even one voice changing can change the sound of a vocal group because the sound of a vocal group, it really is very specific to the sound of those particular voices and who's doing the vocal arrangements. So because we emerged from this college a cappella group that we were all in called the hijinks, the first sound of rock cappella was very much like a cross between barbershop music and doo-wop and uh, old R&B soul, like the persuasions. <clears throat> and then uh, we added vocal percussion. And when we added vocal, per vocal percussion, you know, a drummer who does drums with his mouth, which was a real novelty back then, you know, in, in the late eighties, the only people who were doing human beatbox vocal percussion uh, were hip hop groups. And, but then in uh, in the very early nineties, Rockapella and a couple of other, other contemporary acapella groups added beatboxers or vocal percussionists as they like to call themselves uh, to their, um, rosters and it really changed the sound because all of a sudden it sounded less doo y and more like a band because it had drums vocal drums um and so that changed the way i i did vocal arrangements and um so for the the 11 years that where i was in the group i had kind of a uh it was almost like a formula for for vocal arranging drums the bass singer who was doing like boom, 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 you know, almost like walking bass line, you know, uh, mm -hmm. walking bass line, uh, the sound of like an upright bass, not doing many lyrics, but then occasionally doing like a step out line, like, yeah, or maybe one little comedic line, like uh, in the song, um, Love Potion Number Nine, it's like the band goes, I held my nose, I closed my eyes, and the bass player sings, I took a drink, you know, little. <laughs> Co comedic step step out lines so I, that was my formula it was like you had the lead singer two guys singing backups the bass singer thumping along and the drums doing the drums and for the entire 11 years i was in rockapella that was the formula for me uh scott leonard who's still the the leader of rockapella he he had a similar style of arranging but then when i left the group his his own musical tastes, which uh, tended to be a little bit more contemporary pop and contemporary R and B sounding, uh, sort of changed more to be hit to to reflect his his taste. So he's you know he's a big fan of Michael Jackson and Prince uh, and more contemporary um, pop stuff. So it became a little bit more slick. <clears throat> less Beatlesy and more just more you know sounding more like stuff that was on the radio uh and he's still the the primary vocal arranger for the group so um nice you know there awesome. it, it still sounds like it still sounds like rockapella but it's more his musical taste than my musical taste the first 11 years was i guess more my musical taste and then the last 25 years have been more his musical taste Mm -hmm. definitely definitely so during the rock Apollo days you mentioned the persuasions earlier you got to open acts for such as chuck berry and billy joel and the persuasions can you share yeah. any memories from opening for them well we were so excited just to to uh be on the same bill with them um the first time we I mean, when I was a teenager, I would go see them at this little club called The Bitter End. And uh, I was I was 17. I think I was a freshman in college and I never heard of them. And the other guy said, oh, we got to go see this group called The Persuasion. So we drove down from Providence, Rhode Island to see one of their shows. And, uh, you know, it blew me away because it was it was so gritty and uh, the sound was just so huge. And their bass singer at this beautiful, deep resonant voice and the lead singer jerry lawson uh still you know to this day i think he's he's just one of the great r&b singers ever i mean i think he's up there with otis redding and sam cook and all all of the greats he never quite got his due because the persuasions because they were acapella they were never really played on the radio they never had any really big hits but among 
their fans and people who like that sound, everyone agrees that Jerry Lawson is one of the greatest that ever lived. Um, there's a really good documentary about Jerry Lawson, though, by the way, that came out last year. Uh, so we first met them on, on the set of that Spike Lee and company Do It Acapella PBS documentary, which I mentioned, and that was in 1991. And they, ha they had never heard of us. We were just the white guys who also happened to be on the TV show. <laughs> but <laughs> when, but one, one morning uh, during shooting of that documentary, it was like 7.30 in the morning. We were on set on this, you know, on, on this, this documentary. And we surrounded Jerry Lawson, our hero, the lead singer of the Persuasions. And we said, hey, can we sing some songs with you? And he said, sure. And we started doing our versions of his arrangements for him. And he started singing along. And that that was the beginning of our friendship with the Persuasions and of my friendship with Jerry. So then we then they agreed uh, to do some doubles with us at the line. And typically we would open the show, uh, do a set, then they would do a set, and then we would do a few songs at the end of the show together. And that it was a really winning formula. Uh, first of all, you know, we were the young guys, they were the older guys, we were the white guys, they were the black guys, and then we came together at the end for this beautiful, uh, you know, uh, moment of uh, of togetherness. Um, uh, it was just great. And all of those shows were sold out. Um, and, um, and then uh, we recorded we recorded uh, a song with the Persuasions on the Carmen San Diego album called My Home, a song that David Yazbek and I wrote. Nice. And then um, Jerry invited me to sing Back Up on, a, on one of his solo albums. Uh, so I have really fond memories of Rockapella working with the Persuasions. And then um, Billy Joel, I mean, that was, we sang, we, we sang the, his famous doo-wop song, The Longest Time. We sang that with him two nights at Madison Square Garden in uh, 1991. And wow. um, I mean, that it, yeah, it was, it was huge. It was just a huge thrill, first of all, to be on stage at Madison Square Garden mm -hmm. <laughs> with Billy Joel. But it wasn't mm -hmm. just it wasn't just Billy Joel at those at those concerts. It was um, right. it was the concert for Walden Woods. So it was a uh, it was a benefit to uh, preserve uh, Walden Woods, which is in New England. And so all of these rock stars were on the bill. It was it was Billy Joel, Sting, and Don Henley uh, of the, of the Eagles. So it was, there were so many, there were so many rock stars and famous politicians backstage. It was almost a joke. Uh, I remember hanging out backstage and John McEnroe, the tennis legend, he walks by me and says like, Hey, you know, great job up there. And I'm like, I've been following you since you were 15 years old, John McEnroe. And, uh, mm. uh, Massachusetts, Massachusetts Senator John Kerry, who ended up running, you know, running, being the Democratic nominee for president, uh, uh, you know, a while ago, he said hi to us and, um, Alec Baldwin and all, you know, just all these famous actors and politicians oh, wow. and other rock stars. Yeah. It was, it was like being backstage at the Oscars and then singing on, on stage with Billy Joel was wonderful. Um, we got to rehearse with him. Um, I, I, one of my sort of proudest Billy Joel moments was that it's such a small thing, but it, I remember it so vividly. We, so we got the call to, to back him up on this song, The Longest Time. And I oh, knew yeah. he was, I knew he was a big Beatles fan. So we show up at the rehearsal studio and uh, he comes and greets us. And I knew he was a big Beatles fan. And I had these little pewter Beatles uh, tie tacks. They were, I don't know, I probably bought them for like 20 bucks. And I, they were in the package and it was a vintage item from maybe 1963. And I, said, and I said to him, hey, Billy, I hear you. I know you're a big Beatles fan. I, you know, I please have these as a gift. And he looks at the Beatles tie tacks and he looks at me and says, Hey man, thanks a lot. I really like this. 
And that was it. But I'll, I'll always remember <laughs> giving Billy Joel giving Billy Joel a gift that I think he genuinely appreciated. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, so we did that. We sang back up for him two nights. Um and we met we had met him earlier because we had done uh a benefit for uh a big church in um in New York City called uh Cathedral Saint Thomas the Divine. Billy Joel was a benefactor of that, of restoring that church. And so we had met him there. And I think that's probably how we got that gig is because he saw us sing a couple of his songs there because a year later, uh, his management called us and asked and asked um, us to back him up on that. So that was a lot of, I mean, you know, it was a huge thrill. That's like one of those lifetime things to have sung with Billy Joel at Madison Square Garden. Uh, that's hmm. awesome. <clears throat> So what are some of your fondest and most favorite fan reactions you received over the years? Can I be total can I be honest even if it's uh not child appropriate? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> you totally, absolutely. Oh, wait, am I allowed completely... to, yes, am I allowed absolutely. To, yes. Yes. Am I allowed to curse? Yes. Yes. I could talk about sex. Yep. I could I could say anything. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The to me. Among the funniest things that's ever happened to me having to do with a fan. First of all, I've been really grateful I, to have fan support during my Rockapella years, after my Rockapella years. But I think it was in 1990, 1995 or 1996, Rockapella was playing a huge theater in Providence, Rhode Island. I think it was... Uh, I don't know. I don't remember the name of it. And while we're on stage, a fan comes up to the edge of the stage and and hands me a crumbled up, a, a, a folded piece of paper, like very, like folded that looked like it had been mashed in her back pocket for a really long time. <clears throat> and um, and then after the show. The show, the show ends and I go backstage and I open up and it's a handwritten letter from this woman who had given me the, uh, and she was like, she was maybe in her, in her twenties. And it, it starts this way. Now you sure you've given me your permission to, to say this, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So this mm-hmm. is the letter starts. I, I, I probably even have it somewhere. God, maybe I can find huh. it. Might be here. Let me see if I can find it. Do you have like t- ten seconds? Yeah, yeah. 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 I, yeah. I want to get it right. Hang on, give me one second. Let me see. If, see if I have it here. It's not here, probably because I didn't want my fourteen-year-old uh, daughter to see it. Okay, but Fair the op- the opening lines are: "To whom it may concern, if I had the opportunity to blow Sean Altman of Rockapella, this is what this is what would happen." <laughs> and, oh my gosh okay oh my and, god so and that was the beginning of two pages so a, a loose leaf page both sides of it with the Ooh. most intricate description of how she would blow me oh and, my god and, and that was the best that's that's what that's the best that's the best fan thing that's ever happened to me that's the only time that's ever happened. That's the only time oh that's ever God. happened. Wow. Uh, might want to save this one for prime time then. There you go. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my God. Wow. So that's oh. the thing. After that, there's no other fan story that can rival that. I mean, that, you know, that's all there is. You know, but yeah. the, you know, I guess what's what's unusual about it is that that's the kind of thing that I'm sure happens to real rock stars all the time mm-hmm. but Rockapella's audience was mostly a family audience so it was kids and their parents so to get something like that was so completely out of character that we were all we were, you know everyone in the group is still talking about it like oh, I remember when Sean got that letter in 1995 <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still talking about it too because it's never happened it hasn't happened since <laughs> uh, I mean I'm, uh, I'm sure it's happened to Rockstar but I don't know about that intricate you know i know no yeah and she was uh she was a pretty good writer too 
<laughs> very, uh, ve very good use of, uh, of imagery and uh, metaphor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely sounds about right. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> How long have we been doing the show now? Two years? <laughs> um, yeah. I don't, I don't think. I know, yeah. It's a first. I, I kind of want to ask that question more, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> it's the first time we've ever asked that question, I think. Yeah. And now it won't be the last. <laughs> <laughs> so after your right. time with Rockapella and Carmen San Diego, you composed songs for other projects, including, yes. as you mentioned earlier, the Disney series Out of the Box. How did you begin working on that? Um. I'm, I've mostly gotten work through a, net, a, a network of friends who have all worked in children's television. Um, so my friend, Billy Strauss, uh, I, we went to college together. We wrote, uh, uh, we wrote a, a bunch of songs together. He wrote a really well-known song um, called A Change in My Life, which Rockapella um, performed for many years and then it also was featured in the movie um, A Leap of Faith that Whoopi Goldberg movie and a lot of groups have performed it I mean, Anson's a version of it and uh, Persuasion's did a version and I think I don't know, Sam Harris did a version but in any case he, um, he was the music supervisor for he was the first music supervisor for Out of the Box and he was the music supervisor for um, Explorer and Gullah Island. Hmm. So he, you know, when you're a music supervisor for one of these things, then you're responsible for 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 either writing the songs or farming out the songs to other composers. So uh, he hired me to do to write a few songs for out of the box and then he passed the gig on to uh, another composer friend of mine uh, Bob Golden who I think hired me to oh, write yeah. a few songs yeah um and then um and then through through my friend David Yazbek I met Brian Woodbury who's a oh, composer yeah, yeah oh, so he's a yeah. so he's a composer um you know I He's I've sung backup. I've sung backup and lead on a couple of his records. And wow. uh, he always liked my my voice. And so he hired me to write some songs for the Book of Pooh. And um, I think he may have been involved in another series. I think he he was also Bear, Bear in the yeah, Big Bear Blue the House. House. Yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah. I but I, I never wrote anything for Bear in the Big Blue House. Um, but I wrote a bunch of songs for the Book of Pooh. And I wrote um, a few songs for Out of the Box, and I'm looking at some other things. Let's see. I wrote a bunch of a bunch of one-off things for Nickelodeon, for Nickelodeon shows, and for I did a bunch of promos for Nickelodeon. Um, I wrote a, uh, and then there was a spinoff. Uh, there was a, sh a TV show called Gullah Gullah Island, where I wrote a couple of songs for that show, and then there was a Nice. There was a a spinoff of that show called Binya Binya Polymog. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I think I I co-wrote the theme song for Binya Binya Polywog. Nice, um, nice. So yeah, uh, you know, I'm peaceful, so I you know I'd like to think that they that. Well, first of all, having written the Carmen San Diego theme song, I think it, they they all knew that I was good. But also, you know, you yeah. tend to. Uh, uh, I'm friends with all these people still I've, uh, all these years, so it's hard for me to remember if they gave me the gig because I was good or because I was their friend. I like to, I like to think it was a yeah. I like to think it was a combination of both because, uh, but well, uh, with the way it works in these in these things is that so if you're the music supervisor, and for example, I was the I was one of the music supervisors for Where in Time is Carmen San Diego. So I wrote a bunch of the songs myself, and also I, I may have hired other people to write some of the songs. So 
um, uh, so there could be 50, 50 songs in a series, but you maybe you end up writing 20 yourself and you farm out the other ones to other people. Um, and a lot, you know, and sometimes, sometimes they like what you do and sometimes they don't. So I, like, I know I, I probably wrote seven songs for the Book of Pooh, but I think only maybe four or five of them aired and the others were rejected. But I actually don't remember which, which aired and which were rejected. Same with Out of the Box. I, I, I may have written several songs for them that didn't air. There's only a few that aired, so I, I don't know which is which. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm kind of curious. What's it like working with Tony and Vivian? Well, okay, this is a whole other thing, because Tony and I... Tony James and I have known each other since he was 21 and I was 24. My my very first uh rock band Tony was the was the drummer. So uh wow. Tony, yeah, to, yeah. So Tony and I yeah, Tony and I knew each other when and Tony and I were on tour together in 1985 when you know when he was 21 or 22 and I was in my mid twenties and we were in a, in a kind of like a new wave pop R and B band called blind dates. So Tony's uh, my oldest friends. And then when I, um, then Rockapella got on Carmen San Diego and the band that I was in with Tony broke up. And then, so then I think Carmen San Diego went off the air in 1995. And shortly after that, Tony, got cast in out of the box and I, I had been in touch with him, but, um, but I didn't know anything about out of the box, but it, so it's completely coincidence that, uh, that Tony ended up being, you know, a kid's TV star. And so did I. And then when out of the box was off the air and Carmen San Diego was off the air in the late nineties, Tony was, Tony was the first drummer in my first solo project. And so Tony has drummed on uh, two of my solo albums. And, uh, you know, we're still really good friends. I, I see him and talk to him all the time. Oh, I love Tony. Oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I didn't, I don't think I, I didn't work with Tony when I wrote those songs, but I knew that right. they, that Tony was going to sing them. Uh, definitely. So now what, what was it like working on the book of Pooh? So um, that so Brian Woodbury. Um, so I, I met him through uh, my friend David Yazbek, the guy who no, wrote the which, which He's actually a previous guest. He's, oh, is that right? Awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, Brian. Bri Brian Woodbury. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, he's a, he's yeah. a great friend of ours. Yeah. Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah. In fact, yesterday I guess it was his anniversary of when he met his wife, and uh -huh. a song that he wrote about meeting his wife uh, is the song on one of his solo albums where I, that I, where I sang lead. So he posted it yesterday and I reposted oh. it. It's a really oh. interesting, really interesting. Oh. Yeah. It's oh. called, uh, it's called unspoken love. Really interesting song. Like it's kind of got all these weird jazzy twists and turns. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so I knew him and uh, he, he hired me to, uh, to write some of those songs. And I'm trying to look at, look at some of the titles. Yeah, um, I, I really like some of these. In particular, there was one called "Where Do Words Go." Oh yes, uh, that's a and what was one. what was oh, really yeah. cool about that. So, but you know, so Brian was I think he was living in I'm not sure if he was living in Brooklyn or he was living in California at the time. But you know, we did everything remotely. He would send me a track and the lyric idea, and then I would create a, a demo or sometimes he would have he would send me um sometimes we would go back and forth and send files back and forth uh, every song was somewhat different um but for that song where do words go i remember it came out so well and he and the rest of the uh people from book of Pooh liked it so much that oh. i remember brian brian telling me he said yeah they're gonna try to get Paul McCartney to sing it, and what? there was a so, yeah, there was a 
there was a couple of months period where, the, you know, when it was still in play and they were trying to get it to Paul or get it to Paul's management. And I remember, you know, being a Beatles fan, my head was spinning, thinking like, oh, my God, Paul McCartney might be singing, might be recording a song that I wrote. And I remember talking with Brian saying like, all right, well, if Paul does record it and it ends up being in England, like, I really want to go over to, to England to to be part of the recording. And I remember having this, this conversation with Brian about what we would do if Paul McCartney actually was going to sing the song. Of course, it never happened. And, and the, the final version is me singing it. But I would much rather have McCartney sing it. <laughs> uh, and then some of these other ones are, let's see. So I'm looking at this. Let's go. Then there was a song called Green Thing, which uh, went something like, it's a green thing from outer space. It's got no eyes, no ears, no face. Is it friendly? No. It might be mean, but all they have to do is that it's green. I mean, I, yeah. I, I really like that one. It's kind of jazzy. Then there was a song called um, On the Double, which I really I like that one because it was uh, called like a patter song. Really, really fast lyrics. It was sung by, um, uh, wait, I guess Rabbit? Yeah, I think it was Rabbit, yeah. Yeah. Um, I might even have, I'm, somewhere I have like the demo, I have a demo of all of these somewhere. Um, but I, there was, because it was a patter song, uh, almost like a Gilbert and Sullivan, really, really fast lyrics, there was a lot of interesting internal ramming. It was like, well, I guess I'll just have to work faster and faster and faster and faster with my whiz, whiz, biz, zigzag, lightning kind of speed, my helter-skelter, hurry-scurry, high velocity, with dual double battled and be dexterous intent, I must up my productivity to 200%. So there's like a lot of stuff like that. Uh, I still remember some of these lyrics really well, as you can tell. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was really fun. And then... Uh, then I think there were a couple that got rejected. There was one called that Tigger was going to sing called I Bounce. Hmm. I don't know if it made it, but it was really good. And then there was a song called Building a Beast, which I think was rejected, which I ended up repurposing for another project. You know, that's 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 the thing about writing songs for hire is that if it gets rejected, yeah. you know, you don't get paid. But you put in the work to create the thing and I'll be damned if I'm going to write something good and not use it for something. So the next project that comes along is like, Oh yeah, I got that thing that was rejected. I'll just re re I'll just, you know, change some of the lyrics around and use it for that. Definitely. <laughs> so do you have any favorite songs you wrote for out of the box in the book of poo? Yeah, well, I think I've mentioned the ones, I think I've mentioned all the ones that I wrote for Book of Pooh. So it looks like I wrote, I wrote six. Uh, Where Do Words Go? Green Thing, On the Double. I know those aired, because I remember seeing video for those. There was a song called Impossible to Live With. Oh, yeah. Which is, oh, is the, mm, that air? Yeah. Did it, yes. I guess it aired. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. Wonderful um, kind of duet between uh, Tigger and Rabbit. Love that song. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. All right, cool. Um, all right, that's good. So I think four of them aired. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> and then I think two of them didn't air. I Bounce, that Tigger song, and Building a Beast. I don't think that aired either. So I was four for six. So, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I... I not not a great track record, four for six. I would have preferred five for six or six for six. But I think that's I think that's the only stuff I wrote for them. Um and then out of the box, I think I wrote uh I wrote a song called Group Soup, which I know aired, because Chris, I just sent it to you. Right. Uh yeah. I mean I have my demos of these, but I can't find them but they're on some cassette tape somewhere. But I know that Group Soup aired. 
<laughs> Excuse me. That's okay. I don't know if I don't know if I don't know where you guys are, but in New York City we're battling uh a terrible air quality thing. Yeah. We oh, kind of I'm in Massachusetts, we kind of are a little bit as well. I'm in Maryland yeah. and we're kind of battling it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Oregon, yeah, we're, yeah we're, I'm in Maryland. Kind of like a countrywide so. thing, I guess. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's fun. Yeah. I I I'm calling it the air apocalypse. Air yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. pretty yeah. much. Sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds about right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so you also have your own uh, solo comedy act, Humongous. Can you talk a bit about yeah. that? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I guess I would call it a hiatus because I haven't really done the full show in a few years. Not since. Uh... So, all right. I started my first foray into writing comedy songs, like full on comedy song, just for laughs. Uh, it was 1999. I wrote a song about the, um, the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky sex scandal. Oh boy. A, a, a song. Oh boy. There's, there's a, there's a whole blowjob theme to this entire interview. <laughs> I know. So, <laughs> no, 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 worry, um, don't, don't worry, Jakey. Just do your research. After. So you'll, you'll, you'll be I, fine. I, I wrote, <laughs> so I wrote a song with a a, a, col a friend of a, a fr college friend of mine named Rob Tannenbaum called uh, Hanukkah with Monica, and it was just about it was a bunch of Jewish jokes and oral sex jokes crammed into this one song because um, Monica Lewinsky was Jewish and. Rob Tannenbaum and I are Jewish. And so we just wrote this song about called Hanukkah with Monica. And it was just one big string of Jewish and Jewish jokes and dick jokes. And, um, and it was, it, it was popular and it got a lot of more, it got a bunch of morning radio airplay. So Rob Tannenbaum and I decided to write a few more songs. So uh, we started performing under the name, what I like about Jew. And uh, we started just doing uh, clubs in New York and we would invite other secular Jewish singer songwriters to join us and sing just songs that they had written. And then it was songs and comedy songs. And he and I kept writing and soon we had an album's worth of material and we started touring um, around the country. And, we, and so we toured uh, and supported this album of songs we did for about maybe maybe four years and um but then and then that act broke up uh and he formed his own jewish themed comedy song act and i formed jumungus to do the songs that he and i had written together and a bunch of others that i had written and so i started touring jumungus all over the country and i performed it in maybe five countries in europe and i even sang it in in China. Um, and I put out two albums of comedy songs. So I'll show you the show you the album covers. There's Sean Altman, Taller Than Jesus. <laughs> uh, that's me and that's Jesus. As you can see, I'm much taller than he is. <laughs> and the taller than taller than Jesus is a uh, it's an it's a reference to the fact that in 19 uh, 67, John Lennon, uh, made a famous remark to the London Evening Standard newspaper about how popular the Beatles were and about how Christianity was dying and how kids cared more about the Beatles than about Christianity. And he said, and he was basically talking about how, um, the religion in the world was on the decline and pop music was on the ascent. But he said, uh, you know, the kids aren't, don't care that much about religion. I mean, he said, you know, the Beatles are bigger than Jesus. And he meant it as even, you know, pop music is, is more popular than, than Jesus, but it was taken out of context. And all of a sudden there was this huge backlash against yeah, the Beatles. Yeah, uh -huh. I know. Yeah. Beatles fans were pissed. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, particularly in beyond the, belief, in, particularly in the deep South and the, you know, the Bible belt, right. people saw that comment as him saying that the Beatles were more important 
uh, than Jesus. Right. And he didn't yeah. really mean it that way. But th th nevertheless, it was right. a huge brouhaha. So I wrote a song called Taller Than Jesus, which is basically saying that I'm just taller than Jesus. Uh, so I put out the, I put out that record, and then uh, and then and then uh, maybe six years ago I put out this record, which is called Jumongous, Jumongous, yeah. the mm. least Jewy Jewing Jewville. So you know, <laughs> so I've written uh, I've written about you know twenty five songs of Jewish themed comedy, and you know I love those records, and I toured it for a long time, <laughs> but I was doing um, I was doing clubs. Uh, and I was maybe doing only a dozen shows a year. Uh, I got a lot of great reviews, you know, like the New York Times called me one of New York's, you know, top comedians and the Boston Globe gave me a rave review and compared me to Alan Sherman and uh, the Washington Post, you know, said all these amazing things about me. Um, but I, I never really made any money. <laughs> so... As soon as I started making money with the Everly set, which is my um, Everly Brothers tribute act, and performing in theaters all over the country, I, I you know, there, was, there didn't seem to be any reason to to keep doing Jumongous. So now I just do it occasionally. I did during pandemic. I did like a virtual a virtual concert uh, that is still fun. It was basically it was me performing in this room that you see. Uh, so I still have the act, but I haven't done the show, the full show in a few years. So the albums are out there. They're both on YouTube and on streaming services, but uh, it's not really something that I'm actively working on these days. Definitely. But um, great material. I'll read you some of the song titles. Oh, and there's some really good videos. Uh, I highly recommend checking out the video for a song called Phantom Foreskin. Uh, I've got a, I've got a, a song called um, Tough Motherfucker with an Eye Patch, and that's uh, that's about um, in the in the in the in the 1960s there was a famous uh, a famous war called the uh, in Israel called the Six Day War, where the Arabs the Arab countries attacked Israel, trying to you know trying to exterminate Israel and Israel beat them in six days. And the leader of the Israeli army was a guy named Moshe Dayan. He was bald and he had an eye patch. So when I was a kid growing up, I was so enthralled by this guy. He was so tough and he had an eye patch. He looked like a crazy Jewish pirate. And so I wrote a song called tough motherfucker with an eye patch. There's a great video for that one too. Uh, the, mo the song of, of mine from that project that's gotten the most play is a song called They Tried to Kill Us, We Survived, Let's Eat, which is, which is basically the story of every Jewish holiday. They tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. Uh, and that song has gotten, it's been used in a few, uh, a few independent movies, and it's been featured on um, the radio show Fresh Air with Terry Gross. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm proud of this material. But nice. uh, I don't really get to perform it that much. Hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. So currently you still perform a cappella with some ex acapella members in the Groove Barbers. Yes. Kind of brought that up. How did that come about? So when I left acapella in 1997, I, I still wanted to sing acapella. So uh, two other acapella alums um, where uh where we felt the same way so steve kais who and charlie evitt who were also founding members of rockapella they um we started getting together to, to sing with uh, a, a friend of ours named kevin wiest and uh we started performing you know just a few times a year uh in the in the late 90s and we basically performed we've been performing a few times a year now for you know what is it 25 years so we've put out several albums but it's very much a um it's just a, it's a labor of love you know strangely enough though we we um we appeared on two national commercials uh for aspen nasal spray so uh 
and those were both in maybe the early mid 2000s uh that you can find them on youtube uh and so they um they, yeah they both aired a lot we both we all made a lot of money from being on camera as the astolins a vocal group that brings astolin nasal spray to uh to the population <laughs> nice nice awesome before before I'm we're getting close to wrapping up you also you know you know we went mentioned this earlier but you also worked on the junior series go go islands and and in the and the, the, the spinoff binya binya how how do, how do you kind of like how do you your your experience work on those uh so my friend billy strauss who was a long time uh he produced rockapella uh and then he and i wrote a bunch of songs together he was the music supervisor. of most of the songs uh, on Dora the Explorer. So he farmed out some of those songs for me. And I'm trying to, I'm, I'm looking at this, at my collection of songs from that era. And I'm trying mm -hmm. to, okay. So I definitely did a song called Job Jamboree for Gullah Gullah. <laughs> uh, and maybe one or two others. Oh yeah, there's a song called "The Cowboy Way." <laughs> so, but I don't know what aired and what didn't air. So I know I I know I I co-wrote a song called "The Cowboy Way," and a song called "Job Jamboree" for Gullah Gullah. <laughs> Do you guys know if any if any of them aired? I have no idea. I feel uh... like that cowboy one rings a bell, but again, our fans. Uh, once this goes up, we'll definitely. Let us know. Okay, Let good. us know. Yeah. You actually have an assignment. Let us know. I'm really, <laughs> Let us know. I'm, really, I'm curious, too. I really want to know. Your assignment, America, and our fans can let us know below if you get that reference. Yeah. And <laughs> so, so, did, so did Binya Binya, did that show air? It did, but it didn't. Yeah, it did. only it lasted did it like maybe five episodes. It was very short lived. It was a very oh, okay. short lived oh. show. Okay, yeah, because I remember, I remember writing writing that theme song with Billy Strauss and recording it, uh, but I, I don't remember it airing. But it's maybe it aired and then it was quickly canceled. Yeah, I think so, maybe yeah. it, each episode only aired once. I don't even think oh, okay. there are any reruns. Yeah, no. Yeah, so recordings yeah. of it are definitely hard to come by. Yeah, <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah, yeah. If I ever um, if I ever can find this CD or a duplicate of it, I'll send you. I'll send you some of the demos. All right, for, for cool. a bunch of those okay. songs. So the demos are pretty nice, cool. Yeah. In fact, okay. I think, with all due respect to the people right. who sang them on the thing, I think the demos are probably usually better because the people who ended up singing them on the on the shows were actors. Right, um, they're not necessarily mm -hmm. singers, so sometimes right. the dem the demos are 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 sung or, better or singers. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and funny enough, when we mentioned Go Go Island, we actually previously interviewed one of the one of the kids previously. I'm um, Shanna um Gonzalez, or formerly uh, Shanna uh, Freeman. Oh yes, yeah, Shanna's lovely. Yes. She she's oh, cool. awesome. Yes, she and we also uh she's spoke to a. Uh, Peter Lurie, who worked on that. Yeah, show. Oh, yeah, uh, yes. yeah, yeah. That's Peter right. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh yeah, I saw yes. him. Uh, I saw him like a week and a half ago. Um, oh wow! Because <laughs> we were both. Um, yeah, I've worked with him on stuff too. I mean, he's hired me to sing on things, and uh, I've sung on uh, demos of his. But uh, yeah, we were both at uh, David Yazbek's concert in New York a couple of weeks ago. Oh, nice. <laughs> Very nice. Awesome. Very nice. So what would you like to say to those who have supported the projects you've worked on over the years? I've had, you know, a, a small but loyal and devoted following for uh, for many years. And, uh, you know, I, I've never really I've never really tried to capitalize on um, I've never done like a GoFundMe or anything like that. I probably should have because 
I have enough devoted followers that I probably could have launched another project, but uh, I never felt I never felt like I had to go dip into that well to get a project off the ground. Um, one thing I, I'm thinking of doing though is in this bag, this little plastic bag contains all of the braids that I wore for 10 years when I was on Where in the World is Carmen San Diego. My wow. own human, my own human hair, my own DNA contained in these 50 or so braids of my bleach blonde actual hair. So I think I, I might sell these for like $150 a pop with like a, a certificate of authenticity. <laughs> and, you know, and then once hmm. you have it, you know, you're free to do whatever you need to do. You can clone me. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, if you if you clone me, then you'll have to parent me. And uh, that's not going to be any a picnic. <laughs> So. <laughs> but uh yeah to anyone who's supported me or bought my records thank you uh, yeah yeah pleasure pleasure and uh I, and thank you thank you thank uh all of you for for uh keeping you know the, these strange projects alive oh, many, many many years <laughs> after the fact yeah <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So if people would like to connect with you, where can people find you? Uh they can uh, they can email me directly. It's my initials S A at Seanaltman.com. Nice. It's a S A at S E A N A L T M A N dot com. And if you want to see what um if you want to see me perform lately, if you can go to uh the ever the everly set dot com. It has uh the schedule for both the Everly set and for Ever Simon and Garfunkel, the Everly set.com. Nice. And links to that will be in the description awesome. down below. Thank you. Yes. To connect with you. Yep. And uh, so, this last question we ask, we usually ask every guest. Chris is going to ask this last question. Go ahead, okay. Chris. Yeah. So, of course, this podcast is called Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. When you think of nostalgia, what do you think of, or in your own words, how would you define the word nostalgia? Nostalgia is a really interesting word um, because uh, it's it has subtly different meanings in different languages because <clears throat> I would describe it as a pining like a pining for for uh, for it's pining for a view of a view for something in the past, but it's sort of unrealistic. It's like a, it's like looking at the past through rose colored glasses. So people sort of remember fondly something from their youth, even though while it was happening, it may not have been that good. You know, like people, people, uh, for example, in the my current project, The Everly Set, I'll say to the audience, Oh, those great days, uh, great old days of 1957. And the audience, yeah, you know, nobody talks about that in 1957. You know, America was under the grips of Jim Crow. And, and you know, <laughs> a lot of people couldn't vote. And there was still segregation. So nostalgia is a, is a funny thing. Um, but it, it involves a, 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 a sadness a sadness and longing for times gone by. And for me, I have um, I have a, a nostalgic feeling about Carmen Sandiego. And it's interesting yeah. because while I was on Carmen Sandiego, which, you know, by all accounts, unless something miraculous happens to me in the rest of my life, that will certainly go down as the pinnacle of my career. But while it was happening, I was completely unaware of it. I always, I and the rest of Rockapella, we always thought of it as just something we were doing until the next best thing, the next better thing came along. Mm -hmm. We always thought like, oh, we kind of don't want to be kids TV stars. We'd rather be playing for adults. We want to be really cool. We want to be on the radio. Um, 
it felt sort of um, it felt sort of cheap, and it didn't feel like it was really us. And it's so funny because now everyone I know who was involved in that show, from the producers to the camera people to the uh, the writers, we all look upon that show with incredible nostalgic affection. Like, wow, wasn't that amazing? Was oh, that was such a great time. God, I wish we could get those times back. But while it was going on, it was just it was just another game. Just something to do until the, the the better thing came along. It was like it was just a stepping stone. And that's how nostalgia is kind of remarkable because <laughs> we all look back upon it as this amazing thing. But at the time it was just, okay, we're doing this now and then something better will happen. Yeah, absolutely. Great words. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, good words. Thank you for that. Yes. Well, uh, Sean, thank you so much for taking time to do this. This was a blast. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. Thank blast. you very much. Thank you. And yes, thank you for, for, for... Sorry for all the blowjob uh, references. That's <laughs> yeah, okay. No worries at all. I'll, I'll, and, and... Uh, I'll uh, tell our DJ Bob says hi, by the way. Oh, that's great. I, I, I really like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, he's a great uh, friend of ours, too. Wonderful. Yes. Friend. Yes. Very wonderful. And and thank you so much, Sean, for being for being on. It's been a blast. Thank you for you know, especially for what you've done, and keep up your great work. And cannot what what's what's next? What's next in store for you? I, I'll uh, well, next in store is this Saturday in uh, in Manchester, New Hampshire, at the Rex Theater, where. Uh, but uh, thank you for uh, you know putting my uh, the uh, URL of the Everly set in the uh, in the notes, and uh, I hope people show up at the shows. Yeah. Awesome. Well, enjoy yeah. the rest of your day, Sean. Thanks. Keep in touch. Thanks a lot. I'll, I'll yes. let you know when this yes, goes up. Of course. Up. All right. Sure. Take care. Bye bye. Right. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye Sean. Bye. Sean. Bye. See ya. No, oh, that was a great chat, guys. It was that, my... <laughs> that yes. was definitely something I will say. Yeah. <laughs> that was not what I expecting. Blowjob no, jokes but... included. It was a great chat. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But it's goodbye from us as well. Yes, goodbye absolutely. from us. We absolutely enjoyed our time with Sean Altman and keep on the lookout for more wonderful interviews. And to really end this off, what do we say, Jake? <laughs> keep massage alive. Take care, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye. Take care, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.